Hi, I'm Mark Hobie, Paper Mills Producing Artistic Director, and this is Babbling by the Brook. I'm thrilled to welcome our first guest music director to the program, and she's someone very near and dear to the Paper Mill family. Meg Zervoulis has been involved with Paper Mill since winning a Rising Star Award in high school as student music director. And she's truly been the masterful musical force for our summer conservatory and annual New Voices concert. She's gone on to play in our orchestra, to serve as a musical director for Paper Mill's main stage, and now she's a Broadway regular with conducting credits such as Natasha Pierre in The Great Comet of 1812, The Prom, Mean Girls, West Side Story, and many more. Hi, Meg. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Great to see you. You too. How are you doing? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like forever since I've seen you. Mm-hmm. In person. Um, I know, but I'm glad to see you here. And um, I wanted to talk to you because we've worked together for, well, I guess like a decade, maybe more. I can't even remember. I was just trying to think as I was walking in from the parking lot. I, our first connection has to be through the Summer Conservatory, right? Through yeah. new, the New Voices program. Mm -hmm. Susie Spidel reached out to my um, kind of arts administrator that um, was the supervisor of arts for Bayonne schools. And I had just recently graduated from college and Susie was looking for an accompanist for summer conservatory. And I, that was the first thing I did over at Paper Mill. And um, just for anybody who doesn't know, our, we have a summer musical theater conservatory program, usually about 120 students that study for five weeks. And we work with them all during those weeks in training sessions, but we also gear up for a huge concert at the end, this New Voices concert, which has grown in its size and scope um, and I've just, that's one of my favorite parts of my job, working with you and the team on that concert. And that's how we started our relationship, really, was through that program. Um, and it's become pivotal, I think, to Paper Mill's identity because that program's launched people like, well, Nikki James, Tony Winner, and, you know, Laura Benanti, Rob McClure, um, Anne Hathaway went through it, um, so many people. But um, so you started as an accompanist and then eventually mm -hmm. moved up to musical director and then music supervisor? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and then on to Broadway. Well, you've musical directed at Paper Mill too. Mm -hmm. yeah, most. Did Mary Poppins. Um, I worked as the associate on Oliver. I worked on developing Ever After, which was super fun. A um, Couple others as well. Christmas Story, Bandstand, Ever After, Alf, Mary Poppins, Oliver. That sounds like the ones, yeah. Um, and then it's so funny because uh, I feel like you were already a mature woman when you came to us, but I've watched you grow and watched your career blossom. <laughs> um, and then you've worked on Broadway shows, Natasha Pierre, you were uh, you conducted, right? And then you worked on um, Mean Girls. And then you were you were the musical director for prom. Yes. And now, well, during the shutdown, um, you were working on the new revival of West Side Story. Mm -hmm. So that's been quite a trajectory um, <laughs> over those those last, I guess it's 10 years, right? Yeah, I think it's a little over a decade. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk a little bit about your role as music director or music supervisor um, and, and what those titles mean and what that, what that part of the creative team is like. Because on this series, we've talked to choreographers, we've talked to directors, fight directors, we talked to um, Bill Berloni who trains animals. And <laughs> so uh, you as musical director and different title, different job responsibility, music supervisor, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, in the world of Broadway and musical theater in general, there are a lot of other 
music jobs that um, are a little bit lesser known. Music director, music supervisor, arranger, orchestrator, contractor, copyist, music assistant. I mean, the music team tends to be a really giant group of people, um, especially for the bigger musicals. Uh, music director is the person who generally teaches the score to everybody. They maintain the orchestra, they stay with the show, usually uh, throughout the run to uh, coordinate with the stage manager and do all of the special events and uh, maintain just the caliber of the show and training new cast members as well. When you're making the musical, the music director works directly with the director, which Mark, of course, I've had the pleasure of doing with you, um, yeah. and the choreographer, which we've done together with Dennis Jones a couple of times, which has been so fun, um, to kind of help shape what the sound will be and how the transitions will go and just kind of the musical details that are um, throughout the musical. A music supervisor generally is someone who oversees the entire department of that list that I just mentioned, of all of those people. Um, not every show has a music supervisor. It's usually for the bigger shows that are going to have a global market or are planning on having tours or uh, for the shows that have lots of, um, let's say, cooks in the kitchen on the various teams. And a music supervisor can be super helpful in those kinds of situations to oversee and steer everybody um, as one unit. And associate music director <laughs> is the is what I'm currently doing, and that's um, that's just works closely with the music director, and you conduct a couple shows a week, and normally you um, are also a member of the orchestra. So, and is the music director always the conductor? No, not always. So sometimes those jobs can be divided too. You could have a music supervisor, a music director, and a conductor, mm -hmm. and an associate music director who. I mean, in my experience, typically plays the keyboards, is a piano player, synth player. Um, mm -hmm. And then I always think of that person as the understudy to the conductor, <laughs> right? Everybody Definitely. Needs an, everybody needs an understudy, mm -hmm. right? If you're sick or on vacation or the subway breaks down, right? And um, I guess as an associate, have you been thrown into those situations where all of a sudden they call you up and say, you're on? Yes, I've had as little as I would say 10 minutes, and this is for Broadway too, um, notice to go on, which, you know, it happens sometimes. Um, it's pretty common, especially if the music director on the show is working on another project during the day, which typically is like a 10 to 6 schedule. And um, if he or she has just had a day that went on way longer or was way more whatever you want to say, um, more dramatic or crazier than usual, they may just not feel able to do the show last minute. And that's, um, that's pretty common. And then some days you have, you know, six months notice. Alex Gemignani at West Side Story, who's my boss, um, gives me like six months notice. And I know when I would, am conducting, you know, in Christmas. <laughs> um, so, so it really varies. Well, that's, and that's, I mean, that score is really tough, that Bernstein music and um, I imagine a fairly big orchestra. But the thing is, you're not walking in completely unprepared because you will have been through the rehearsal process learning the show as the mm -hmm. associate, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a, a, a bag of tricks <laughs> or knowledge to be able to step up to the podium. What was the first show you conducted on Broadway? Uh, that was Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. <laughs> yep. I was um, an assistant conductor there, which means kind of a part-time person who isn't part of, who doesn't go there every day to work and is not a part of the orchestra, but is one of the people um, walking around in New York who knows how to conduct the show. And so um, we had a couple assistant conductors at Natasha Pierre and my dear friend, Matt Dobler, who he and I have worked together for you guys before. Um, we met at uh, ELF at Paper Mill. And since then, we've kind of been colleagues. He gave me my first uh, Broadway conducting opportunity. And that was crazy because we wore a costume. I had to dance. I had to sing. I had to play the accordion. It was pretty wild. I, I would not suggest that as anyone's <laughs> Broadway debut. <laughs> yeah, that is a crazy, that's not... I mean, stepping onto the podium for the first time in front of a Broadway orchestra, Broadway audience in New York, um, that must be crazy, exciting, nerve wracking, anxiety producing anyway. But to know that you had to do the Tosh Pierre and the Great Comedy of 1812, it, it's that crazy, complicated show um, where everybody plays a million different things. So I didn't realize you did all that too. 
danced and played the accordion and sang. Mm -hmm. Do you have any lines? Uh, I can't even remember. <laughs> I, I, it, but it was pages and pages. A lot of um, subconductors will take pages and pages and pages of literally every single thing that you have to do. Because it, other than just playing and conducting, we have the pedal on the left, we have the pedal on the right, we have to pick up the phone for the stage manager. So just because um, if you're an outsider, if you're one of those assistant conductors, it's really common to prepare yourself by literally typing every single time you lift a finger to do that and then just memorize it because it's um it's real brain workout for sure you know i think i think that people don't realize how challenging a job you have as a conductor um all we see from the orchestra is the back of someone's head and arms <laughs> you know, waving in the air and everybody thinks oh well if you just wave your your arms in time to the music everybody plays along but you're really responsible for however many players there are in the pit, coordinating all of those, but also um, about feeling the action and what's happening in the show, right? Mm -hmm. And it's such a key position, I always find, um, connecting the band, who most times can't see the action on the stage, right, to what's happening yep. on stage, right? Do you, do, mm -hmm. uh, you must, how do you learn that? How do you feel that? How does that happen? Hmm. Those are the kinds of things that I think are tricks of the trade that you pick up on your way. You know, sometimes it's if you missed a cue sometime in your history. Um, sometimes if it's that you've worked a director in the past, who's like, keep it tighter. Um, I feel like you've taught me a lot of that. And people are always complimenting my pacing on the podium, meaning how quickly we go from the last line of a scene into a song. And I feel like I, I learned that definitely um, working at Paper Mill for sure and working with Casey Nicola, who, you know, that's, that's his thing. We got to keep the pace going, especially for comedy. Um, so yeah, it's, if I, I would say that it's something that you just learn as you go. And for working on the prom, for example, you mentioned um, being responsive to the actors in the minute. Uh, I worked with Brooks Ishmanskis and Beth Level, who are two, you know, musical theater giants, but they're also <laughs> extremely creative on the stage. Never two shows are the same in a row, and they always love kind of playing games. And I really had to be, me and uh, my other associates on that show, Ted Arthur and Nate Patton, had to be ready at any minute for whatever Brooks was going to say, or however long Beth was going to hold her crazy notes. And, and that was just my favorite memories ever. I mean, just like waiting for them to, to do their magic and just to try to ha have myself and the orchestra be right there with them. And, and I can imagine that. I've worked with Beth a couple of times and she is an amazing, but a brilliant comedian and, you know, knows how to milk an audience. So if they're going with her, she's going to go. <laughs> but even in like West Side Story, a more traditional classical musical, um, uh, when... Tony and Maria are singing tonight, they can get caught up in the emotional moment and you have to be there with them, right? With bringing yeah. them along or reining them in if they're going on too long. You know, you, you kind of have to, I always watch you as a conductor and I feel like you breathe with the stage and bring the band along with the, what the moment is on stage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I feel like that's the definition of our, of our job. West Side Story, I would say, especially because we have a bigger orchestra um, and just some of the challenges of the, the specific version that we're doing, um, I, it has been super challenging. Natasha Pierre was challenging in another way, kind of in a lots to do way, but this, musically speaking, I would say is the most advanced um, conducting that I've had to do in musical theater, for sure. And do you think it's because of the Bernstein score, because of how complicated that score is? Or does it also have to do with, um, many people probably might not have seen that production yet because it hasn't opened. Did it open? It opened right before we shut down. Oh, yeah. like, right, I couldn't, can't remember what shows, them, but right mm -hmm. before, and I, I was lucky enough to see it, but it's so complicated with the video and the live component of the, the filming on stage and just, but just when you think about the, the rhythms of the dance music alone mm -hmm. and the, the, the ballads and that just the musical styles are so complicated. But is it, is it the music or is it the combination of all of those things working together? Uh, I would say both, really. And it's also uh, we're missing an element at Westside, which a lot of shows have right now, which is click track. 
Um, many of the shows that are on Broadway right now tend to have clicks throughout, you know, meaning the musicians are hearing clicks in their ear that represent the tempo of the song um, to kind of uh, promote consistency. That's usually the reason or to have additional tracks playing. But at Westside, um, our conductor just wanted it to be acoustic. And so did the Bernstein estate. We worked a lot with Alex Bernstein, who's Leonard Bernstein's son. And they were really committed to keeping it pure and natural and acoustic. And so because we don't have click tracks to kind of keep us honest, another added layer of difficulty is knowing just in your heart where the tempo goes, which is such an unspeakable thing, but it is a real super challenge um, for us. It is a challenge. And I have to say the whole world of click, um, click tracks, which are either recorded extra music, sometimes they're vocals that sweeten the vocal. But like you said, there's this click that goes on all the time, keeps everybody in rhythm and allows the tape. I mean, nobody uses tape anymore. <laughs> the tape to match up with the live sound. Um, but that was just coming into play when I was leaving performing. Um, and in a way, I understand it, certainly as you know, orchestra sizes have gotten smaller and even cast sizes have gotten mm -hmm. smaller. You don't have a vocal chorus that can be off stage singing during the dance numbers. Um, but it does, to me, take away a little bit of that magic, which is the moment of everything happening live. Um, and like you said, I always marvel at um, conductors especially, but also drummers, they're, they're the key, right? Mm -hmm. Who feel the tempo, right? Mm -hmm. You say, the tempo's like, a, and we, all, we say it too, we say it's a, it's a click too fast, but that click means <laughs> the metronome, not the yes. click. It's one click too fast, or it's one click too slow, but it really is instinctual, right? You're playing it, and you feel it in your body, you, I'm asking. Yeah, I, um, at West Side Story, the moments where I know I'm really off is if I catch a glance from a dancer who usually is just flying fancy free and like the mambo for example and I could just tell in the way that they're looking down that there there might be some mania going on <laughs> uh, my first couple of shows over there I, the choreographer's associate was like man I think everyone lost five pounds in that mambo <laughs> and so um I try to really read the actors you know I've studied the choreography as Alex was shaping the show with the choreographer just to so to know in my own body when I'm looking at them to see if they're exasperated that can be a good measure for hey I'm too fast or if Shireen who plays Maria um, seems like she just can't make a phrase that is usually effortless for her then I know in the ballads that I'm too slow so right. I try to have reference points um, and of course the orchestra's performance can be very revealing too if I hear you know the sub pianist having trouble I'm like maybe I'm a little too bright there um, so those are just some tricks but all in all you want to make sure that you have it um, kind of right in the center of your feeling and the other thing that I don't, I, I don't know that people um, realize is we all know that in Broadway shows, in any musical, there are understudies, there are swings, there are people that go on, and then there are um, cast changes, especially if a show runs for a good amount of time. People come in, people leave, they go to new jobs, and uh, replacements come in who are taught by you, the music director and the associate mm -hmm. music director, I assume, and the stage manager and dance captain, but you have an added element, which is that the musicians have the ability to sub out, that it's part of their contract, and it's just the world of being a, a gig musician, is that mm -hmm. you don't necessarily play eight shows a week, every week, 52 weeks a year. Even mm -hmm. if you have that job, you're able to um, take other gigs and, and work it out. But that makes it more challenging for you to look out into the pit each night and see some new faces, mm -hmm. right? And um, that must be difficult, especially in a show like West Side where the music's so complicated. Yeah, it's really difficult. At um, West Side, I feel like I've witnessed a way deeper kind of investigation into each of the sub players before they're even invited to play. And I have understand obviously the reason why because the musical caliber that we're upholding over there just is is really serious um it's lincoln center ish you know it just has that extra layer and so a lot of the subs that we've attracted are people who hold permanent chairs at the met opera or permanent chairs at the new york city ballet so that also has been um 
a little bit of a new skill for me. I came from a classical background, but as an adult, um, any classical stuff that I've done is a little bit more contemporary. So interacting with these classical musicians who, um, who are really just so accomplished has been um, a new facet of this gig, but, but it's so exciting. And, and yeah, the subbing, the science of subbing is very complicated. Do you ever, and how, do you know before you step up at the podium who are in the sub chairs? You know who are yes. new players each night? Mm -hmm. Every show has an in-house contractor. Well, most shows, as long as you have eight players, I think, um, eight players and more, there's um, an in-house contractor, which is um, someone who is responsible for basically maintaining the attendance of the musicians, whether it's the regulars, which is what we call ourselves, or the um, the subs. And he or she will place a little map on our music stand with little boxes to show us who's sitting where, you right. know, cause the first few times like random trumpet guy comes in, I want to be able to interact with him by knowing his name. And there's, you know, sometimes in a, especially in an orchestra of 26 people, we have sometimes 10 subs and it's just impossible for us to know at first who they are. Right. Um, and also I imagine you want to know, who those subs are so you if there are particularly challenging spots or there's cues where they have to come in you think ahead of time mm -hmm. along with a million other things you have to do coordinating the stage and the actors everybody else picking up the phone to the stage manager and singing and dancing if it's Natasha Pierre and, and playing the whatever it was um, accordion um, mm -hmm. how to cue those musicians to help them out too right Absolutely. And I learned that from um, the first music director that I played for on Broadway was David Holsenberg, who is another total musical theater great. Um, and he, I, that was on Matilda, which is a super complicated uh, piano score. Seems to be what I attract. <laughs> um, so, but uh, I remember his eyes were like, here comes your part. <laughs> and I will never forget how that completely transformed my like just how I was able to be calm and play those first few shows um, on Broadway and so I try to do the same thing for players. Yeah it's so funny that I think as audience members well we're not supposed to know but uh, I don't think people realize um, how much prep work goes into getting a show to the point of being open either at Paper Mill or on Broadway and then how much happens to maintain it keeping understudies prepped and new people coming in and orchestras changing and subbing every night. I want to, before I forget, I want, you have a couple of projects coming up that are exciting. Broadway Vacation, which mm -hmm. hasn't started yet, and then Otherworld, mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, I don't know how to pronounce the public theater piece. Is it Bunuel? Ah, Bunuel. Bunuel. Yes. But, um, talk, talk about some of <laughs> Sure. Um, unfortunately, the way that schedules have gone, I'm no longer working on Otherworld. Um, oh. They were going for their out-of-town tryout at Bucks County Playhouse right when West Side Story was opening. So unfortunately, I had to withdraw, um, but that was such an amazing piece to work on. Um, it's about video games and how people become heroes through playing them, and I just, it, I love it. It's all about inclusivity. It is a show that the world needs right now, yes. and um, I was heartbroken to see that the shutdown happened like in their second preview so hopefully they get say, back on their feet i have to say i agree with you i saw a workshop of that and the inclusivity part of it is amazing um that and it allows that because you're you kind of go into the video game um and live in the world of the characters in the video game so there's a fantasy element of it which allows anybody to be a part of that world which is thrilling and exciting but the way they celebrate everyone's um strengths and challenges in in that casting i think is great i can't wait for that one to to make a bigger hit a big bigger platform me too um, so, um broadway oh. vacation mm -hmm. is the adaptation of national lampoons basically of all of those movie properties um we were slated to go to seattle fifth avenue uh we hope that that will still be happening but we're not really sure that one's a big fun musical and then Benwell is um sondheim's next musical <laughs> which um he's Amazing. written act one yeah he's written act one the last time we worked on it was kind of in a public theater small workshop so also tell me about the visitor the Visitor um, is a beautiful show. It's um, 
written by Tom Kitt. The music is an original musical of his, which is so exciting because um, he and I have worked together a couple of times over the years, but I'm so happy to be back working with him again. The director is Dan Sullivan, mm. who's um, been around forever, and he'll say that himself. And the fun fact about that is it's his first musical. So I tend to be a music director that likes to really dig in and work directly with the director. And um, I hope he's appreciating it, but that's been a really funny um, process. Um, and it's a beautiful show about um, people um, from different cultures and backgrounds connecting to one another through music. And there's a little bit of discussion about current issues, ICE and detention centers. And so it's, um, it's a really important story. And the shutdown happened the day before our Zitz probe, which um, was super, super painful timing, but hopefully that one will get back on its feet. Yeah, it's, uh, that one sounds exciting, too. I want to talk about two more things, which is your chamber ensemble. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, um, I am the resident conductor for Hotel Elephant. I've been working with them for, I don't know, maybe eight years or so. Uh, it is a new music ensemble. It's an, mostly instrumental, and we develop and premiere works of composers who are living today. So 21st century composers. And um, through that ensemble, I've met a lot of friends who have remained friends throughout all of this time. And um, that's really exciting. And the one other thing I think is so, you've, you've played and worked with a lot of people, but one of the things that, I, that jumped out to me when I was doing a little research for this was Big Apple Circus, which <laughs> I just love the Big Apple Circus. <laughs> so, you, you were in the band for that? What, what was your connection to Big Apple Circus? Well, since we talked about subbing before, I was a keyboard sub for the Big Apple Circus for two years. And um, fun fact with that is that the guy who was the conductor of the Big Apple Circus forever, which if you've seen it before, he's the guy who plays trumpet up there and he does all this other stuff. Um, he ended up being our trumpet player in the prom, which was just a funny like full life circle. Um, and I have to say, although the circus is silly and, you know, sometimes we have to wear crazy costumes and stuff. And there are a lot of, you know, like, you know, you're walking through a barn to go up to the, to the platform. Some of that music is extremely difficult. There's a lot of jazz improvisation. There's a lot of like classical references and stuff, and you have to be able to play every style of music. So that was another really good subbing crash course for me. And that's how I met Christy Norder, who now works very closely with the orchestras at Paper Mill. Um, yeah. so that's that was fun <laughs> I just I I love that experience I've been to the Big Apple Circus several times and um, it's it's the ultimate circus experience I think because it's that one ring you are right there it's everything you expect in a circus and more story music laughter clowns um, all like under that one tent and, and just so exciting and you know another thing I don't we all see the band in that, but no one realizes how pivotal the music is to an event mm -hmm. like the circus, right? It is a almost completely scored like a movie, right? You, yep. you play top to bottom. Yes, and he does all of that. His name is Rob Slavic. He resigned um, last year, or retired rather, after a long career with them. But I was just amazed. I was wondering, you know, who did all these arrangements? And then I saw the same name on every chart. And we never, yeah, we never stopped playing all night, except when the ringmaster does his like main intro. But right. I think I think yeah. people forget about that. They don't they don't realize it. it's just so, it's part of the environment of the moment, you know. But but it is the energy of what gives. Uh, that whole event energy is the music, right? Telling the story, because yeah. there's no dialogue, right? I mean, except when the ringmaster introduces things. But um, yeah. the other thing I think that people aren't quite aware of is how strenuous your job is physically. That mm -hmm. there's a lot of energy expended and physicality to the work that you do. Um, so like we know that actors get injured or sore or tired, but you never think about a conductor mm -hmm. um, standing at a podium for two and a half hours or sometimes sitting if you're playing or mm -hmm. like prom, if you're actually sitting on the floor of the, the <laughs> orchestra level, right? How physically demanding <laughs> that is. Do you train for that? Do you warm up? Like, what do you do? Uh, a lot of people warm up, you know, like do arm stretches, do finger stretches, play scales. Um, also, it's a lot of lower back strength, even if you're 
sitting at a keyboard and playing or if you're standing all night long. A lot of people are very specific about the shoes that they're wearing when they're conducting, what the floor is like, is there a rug, is there a little platform? So um, you can kind of work to start to curate your space a little bit so that it's a little bit healthier. Um, luckily so far, I haven't had any hand injuries, but um, you know, as you age, um, I, most musicians that I know um, encounter something at some point, whether it's, you know, natural arthritis, carpal tunnel, um, shoulder pain from conducting and playing the violin and string instruments and stuff. So it definitely is, you know, Alexander technique, massage, acupuncture. Those are words I'm hearing all the time um, in the land of Broadway. It's so funny because when you think of a musician, you picture someone sitting in a chair playing an instrument. And when you, we associate the conductor as part of that world. But I always, I always think of the conductor almost as a dancer, um, you know, interpreting the music, physically bringing people in. There's a lot of, I, I watch conductors sweating because they are working so hard. And you do that eight shows a week on your feet, just like the performers do on stage. And I think, I don't think conductors get enough credit for, for what they do. Okay, so before we finish up, two things I want to talk about. The first one, of course, is Mary Mitchell Campbell, who uh, is a friend of mine from a long time ago, and we've worked together. And she was kind of a mentor of yours, I believe. In fact, um, I always say she stole you away from us, but in the best possible way. She kind of gave you your first breaks uh, in New York, right? Definitely. Um, she gave me kind of the connection to the keyboard player at Matilda. He was looking for pianists. They, they just wanted to kind of expand their stable of subs, sub pianists on that difficult book. And it was right around the time where I had met Mary Mitchell through a variety of things. One of them in, is Ever After at Paper Mill. Right. And um, I remember she and I had many lengthy discussions just about like taking this big step. And I recall that she had a conversation, I think with you and Patrick too, just like, I believe that in this moment for her. So um, I'm forever grateful to not only her, but the two of you for just, you know, helping to, to make all of that happen. And we've gone on to work together, she and I, um, in many productions. We're still working together on developing new pieces. And um, she's definitely um, become another guardian angel for sure. Well, she's a wonderful woman, wonderfully talented and just an amazing woman. Um, but, uh, you know, the world of conducting and music directing was totally male. Um, it was only men until recently, I would say. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it's great that she sort of picked you out. I mean, obviously you had the talent, you met through Ever After and Patrick and I, Patrick Parker, our associate artistic director, um, we had nothing but the greatest things to say about <laughs> you. Um, but it's sort of like sending your kid off to college. You know they'll come back to visit, but they'll never be living with you again. That's, that's kind of the way I felt when, she, when you guys connected. But I'm so happy because, boy, what an incredible mentor to have and a connection just in the world of music in New York. Mm -hmm. But anyway, before we wrap up, I just have to mention two more names, and those are Molly and Donna. <laughs> Molly is your sister who also works with us, who is so wonderful and teaches um, uh, children with challenges. She's a special ed teacher and just incredible, magical and been helpful to us. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and your mom, Donna, who I always knew. Oh, sorry, family. guys. <laughs> I always knew you as Meg until I met your mom, and Donna's always like, Megan, Megan, I was always like, who's <laughs> um, But it has been wonderful to us, too, and we're, we're just lucky to have the Zerulis family as part of our family, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge them and thank them for loaning you to us and your talent, and um, we just couldn't love you more and are so proud of all the great work you're doing. I'm sure they're watching, so let's just... <laughs> take a moment and send our love out to Molly and Donna. <laughs> and uh, just so great spending this time with you, Megan. I can't wait to be back in a, in a studio somewhere working with you and your brilliant talent on a musical. Thank you so much for having me. Love you. Love you too. Bye. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We hope to see you here again next week for more Babbling by the Brook.